Welcome everybody to uh, today's virtual briefing of uh, the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. Um, today it's uh, taking place in the framework of um, our Livestock Pastoralism work stream. Uh, livestock Pastoralism um, was decided to be a focus area of the platform at uh, this year's annual General Assembly. And uh, if you have a look at the, the war plan, uh, one of the top priorities of the group was uh, to exchange information on pastoralism from uh, different world regions. Uh, so uh, we are definitely very happy to have uh, Michel Nouri today with us as a presenter, who uh, has worked um, until recently for uh, the European Commission, and uh, now he is uh, back in the picture as a consultant, um, following up with his work on uh, pastoralists in uh, dryland areas. And uh, today's title of the presentation will be Sustainable Livelihood Approaches to Pastoralism. Well, first and foremost, let me thank you for this opportunity to talk about pastoralism in general. I mean, pastoral livelihoods, it is a subject that I'm concerned with, but is also of increasing concern for the whole international community, even though this is not very often acknowledged. Uh, let me start where well, the title has changed a little bit. It talks about sustainable development in pastoral regions with a question mark at the end because uh, there are many questions to be to be raised to this respect. The content of the presentation will hinge uh, along three main axes, three main lines. The first one will be a presentation of who are the pastoralists. The second one would try to, the second part would try to explain why pastoralism is relevant in the current picture and why, still in the current picture, why are pastoralists so vulnerable. Uh, I will try to provide some some references and some experiences whenever possible, but given the limited time frame, I'd be glad to go more into detail uh, during the discussion in case. Let me start with a provocative introductory question uh, and, uh, and, and list a number of regions of the world from Afghanistan to Somalia, Middle East, Karamoja, Kurdistan, Southern Sudan, the Ogaden, and more lately Sahara and the Sinai Peninsula and uh, to ask, to raise the question, what have these regions in common? And uh, in my opinion, they have two main, uh, two main elements. One is that they are inhabited by pastoralists, and the second one is that they are, they are involved into uh, long-standing conflict dynamics. And uh, unfortunately, there's a, a good reason for that, to associate pastoralism with conflict. Uh, let's go into the presentation, and therefore, we can try to understand why. As we said, we start talking about who are the pastoralists. The pastoralists are the communities that live through mobile livestock keeping, meaning that livestock represents the vital, let's call it vital technology that enables translating the grasslands, the shrubs and the trees, the resources of the rangeland into food products for the people. Uh, second element is the mobility, that is a strategy uh, through which livestock are brought around and uh, the scarce and variable resources are, are utilized. And the third element is the flexibility uh, of the arrangement. The, the rules of the game are flexible because uh, in, order to able, in order to access different, uh, let's say, land resources in different times, there's a need for a kind of flexibility. So uh, the property rights are not formally recognized as it is in other cultures. Uh, when we look at the, the world picture pastoralism, I mean, the, the pastoral areas cover about one-fourth to one-fifth of the the world's land area, uh, the highlands and the drylands, to be simple, and, and, and pastoralism provides direct support to about 150 million people all over the world. And there are different definitions between pastoralism and agropastoralism, but 150 million people is more or less the figure that everybody agrees on. And these people are very often located in, in, the, in the poorest regions of the world. Uh, Highlands and drylands in the different in the different countries and the different regions provide a, a good environment for different animals. So different animals support pastoral livelihoods in the different regions. Here we have a sketchy table with some of the main main relevant species with this respect in the different zones. Uh, looking somehow into the pictures and to bring on some colors, uh, we have uh, the area where we find. Uh, Relatively, most pastoralist is the area from Mauritania to Somalia, the Sahara, the Sahelian belt. The picture on the, with the horse is from Mauritania. The last one with the ladies in the camel milk marketing is from Somalia. 
but we also find pastoralism in the Mediterranean and in fact if we look at all the countries facing on the Mediterranean basin and all the cultures and religions that have been have been developed throughout the Mediterranean, we always find good references to pastoralism. From David to milk to the lamb, uh, let's say that pastoralism somehow embeds any kind of, of Mediterranean culture. Here we have pictures from Morocco to Jordan. And even in Central Asia, we find a good number of pastoralists on the highlands of Tibet, Mongolia, but even in Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan, and uh, in Afghanistan, as we said before, and even in Pakistan. Uh, in, a, in other areas, there are, uh, the presence of pastoralists is, uh, is relative. The picture with the, the, the lady with the two lambs is from Iran, where pastoralists constitute from 3 to 5 to 5% of the population, and the other teacher is from Bolivia, from the Andes, where we also find pastoralists. Pastoralists live with a double set of marginalization. One is, uh, just to be very sketchy, be very simple, the kind of agricultural uh, marginality, uh, marginality of the environment, the harsh environment they live on. We said about uh, the arid and fragile territories, drylands or highlands they inhabit, and these, these environments are characterized by three main uh, features that characterize the, the, the natural resource base and the natural resource utilization. One is the limitations of uh, overall of the water availability that provides important constraints to the overall biomass productivity of, of an area. Second one is the fact that this availability of water is also variable in terms of time and space, meaning that from one year to another, from one decade to another and from one valley to another, the, the difference in rainfall patterns could, uh, could change quite consistently. The third element that is very often overlooked but is also very important is the unpredictability of the climatic patterns that uh, affect these territories. Because uh, the fact that there's no kind of reliability or, or reliable system on which uh, the rainfall patterns could be, could be assessed provides a further element uh, that creates uncertainty somehow in the production system. Just to provide you an, an example about the variability that I was mentioning, here we have uh, a graph indicating the rainfall patterns for the Sahelian region, so it's a regional scale, but gives you already kind of a good idea about the variations that could go through from one year to another and one decade to another. I mentioned double set of marginalization. The second one is uh, the socio-political marginalization pastoralists have to live with. They are often located in frontier lands because as the things have happened, very often mountains and uh, deserts, that are the areas where pastoralists are very often found, have been used to define the boundaries of countries. So they, they tend to be located on the borders of geopolitical uh, uh, the geopolitical setting. That means they are very often remote from the mainstream uh, central power, state power, the, the centers of state power, or the centers of market power. So they tend to be located in, in, in kind of remote areas with a lower attachment to these kind of powers. Uh, pastoral lands are very often huge extension with very low population density, meaning that the transaction cost of any kind of policy or any kind of investment are very high. And uh, given the fact they are located on borders, they are very exposed to conflict. When the, whenever there's a war between two countries, very often it's on the border that, it, it's, uh, that the conflict takes place. Recent cases from India to Pakistan, Eritrea and Ethiopia, Southern Sudan and Northern Sudan. So pastoralists, they tend to be, they happen to be in the middle of, of a war that has been decided elsewhere somehow. And that, there's also the, um, the, the impact of refugee in, in influx as well as cross-border traffic that is also related to the closeness to boundaries. Second part of the presentation is why is pastoralism so relevant nowadays? Because it's been increasingly acknowledged that, uh, uh, the, that pastoralism not only provides valuable products from kind of fragile and uh, limited ecosystems, but is also important in terms of providing good environmental services and as a good way to control the strategic territories, as we've seen. Uh, just as an example, some data just to provide some, some guidance about the relevance of, uh, of pastoralism to the economy of poor countries from, again, on the Sahelian fringe, from Mauritania to Somalia. These figures are, they represent the contribution of, uh, of, of, of pastoralism to the, the agricultural GDP in, in these countries, Mauritania, Senegal, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. So all along the Sahelian belt, 
the agricultural GDP is mostly based on, uh, on pastoral production. When we talk about these figures, it, we always have to be very skeptical because official figures in, in pastoral areas are, are always to be, to be doubt because uh, there's no, there's, it's very costly to get uh, the right figures in pastoral areas. So these are kind of proxy figures that indicate already uh, the consistency of pastoralism. At the end of the slide, you can see a reference to a very good document, Pastoralism Dryland's Invisible Asset, that was edited in 2006 by IID and provides a good reference about the contribution recognized and not recognized of pastoralism to these, um, to these countries and these areas. But we also talk about environmental services. That is something that has been increasingly appreciated from, uh, from pastoral areas in terms of uh, the management of, of fragile ecosystems, such as the trilands. In terms of pr protection of biodiversity, uh, conservation of land and water, and the sequestration of CO2 or carbon sequestration. This happens, all this happens if there is a, a good and a sustainable rangeland management in place, and this is very often given by good pastoralist practices. So uh, if pastoralism is, is properly implemented, this should have very many, uh, uh, let's say, positive environmental outcomes. This is not by chance. In fact, that most natural parks and reserves from the Serengeti to the Kruge to the Masai Mara are coming to Europe from the Abruzzi or the Pyrenees in Spain. They are all, uh, they've all been carved out from pastoral areas because the biodiversity that has been protected in those areas is higher. Uh, FO in 2009, but, the, but other agencies as well, have been acknowledging that the, the potential for CO2 sequestration of grassland in Asia and Africa is very high. And even the uh, European Union Common Agricultural Policy that has been recently redrafted, I mean, revisited somehow, takes, in, uh, takes into account these positive, let's call them externalities of pastoral management. A good uh, website to, to look for some documentation with this, this aspect is the one of the World Initiative for Sustainable Pastoralism that is indicated in the slide. The third element that has been uh, recently acknowledged, but to me is one of the most critical ones to reconsider pastoralism, is the fact that pastoralists living upon uh, strategic territories, they hold, they have a specific, let's say, political role within a certain national and regional setting. Uh, L'Agence Française du Développement uh, this year has been starting looking into the, the relevance of looking into pastoral livelihoods for, for keeping uh, security into the Sahelian region. Next year in Jamena in March, they, they're organizing a seminar with this respect. Unfortunately, when we look at the current trends, there are many things that are not going in the right direction in pastoral areas, and uh, very often the words of destitution, food insecurity, famine, uh, poverty, exclusion, vulnerability, are those associated to this environment. And uh, there's a good reason for that in the sense there are clear indications that this is the case, that pastoral livelihoods are increasingly unsustainable uh, in larger parts of the world. Uh, we are going to address the reasons later on, but let me just add to the fact that uh, very often in pastoral areas we also have found, there's an interesting World Bank report from some years ago, the highest rate of failures from development projects and programs and from uh, investment from the national government. So, it's not only difficult to live in pastoral areas, it's also difficult to invest in pastoral areas. And most likely because still the fine tuning, the interfacing between uh, different cultures has not yet taken place. One figure again to show what I'm talking about. This is a, a graph showing the human development index in uh, uh, pastoral regions of Kenya from West Pokoto to Turkana. And we can see that those, uh, those figures are uh, lower not only than the Kenya average, but also the Sierra Leone average, that is the poorest country in the world when it comes to the HDI. So uh, overall, pastoral areas tend to, I mean, the pastoral people tend to live in uh, uh, conditions when it comes to human development that are much lower than any other population in the world. Then it comes to the issue, why are pastoralists so vulnerable? A main aspect to me is that pastoralists are still, are still critically dependent on the natural resource base. Uh, to a good extent, the integration into state-based or market-based dynamics is very weak, and this has not uh, been uh, sufficient to uh, somehow to absorb the fact
fact that there's a hugely and fast growing population density on rangelands. Uh, when we look at the figures from uh, the last decade uh, in the Sahel, meaning Mali, Niger, and Chad, the yearly, yearly rate growth rate of population, sorry, the uh, yearly growth rate of population in uh, these countries, in pastoral areas of these countries, is higher than 3%, meaning that uh, in a few decades, the population doubles. And it's clear that with the changes in the ecosystem and the uh, and, uh, competition on land, these figures cannot be supported only by pastoralism. So pastoralism can survive if properly integrates into other kind of settings. Because, uh, as we said, this kind of dependency on the natural resource base ha has also to take into account that the ecosystem of pastoralism has been changing. The rangelands have been degraded in certain areas because of deforestation, because of uh, desertification and other processes, and there's also a process of climate change that is quite visible in specific regions. So the population is growing, the ecosystem are changing, and uh, this couple with the fact that the integration with state-based and market-based dynamics is not yet that uh, fine-tuned, provides a kind of di difficulties for pastoral livelihoods to readapt and to change accordingly. And then there's the issue of conflict that is very often associated to pastoral, uh, to pastoral areas that uh, hampers the access to certain areas and to certain resources. One element that uh, is therefore critical is the issue of access to land that is increasingly challenged in many regions of the world. Uh, there's a study from uh, International Land Coalition, whereas uh, uh, about one fourth of the, the contracts and the deals related to international land acquisition are made upon uh, the rangeland. And this is easily said because are the areas less densely populated, uh, and therefore for the government it's less difficult to allocate their rights to somebody else. Uh, ILC, the International Land Coalition, has uh, set up recently an observatory that is called the Rangelands Observatory in order to better understand and analyze the dynamics taking place in rangelands when it comes to international land acquisition schemes, as well as to look into the implications of these trends. This means that on their own pastoralists uh, are uh, not so able nowadays to uh, enhance or uh, to improve their livelihoods through the, the typical dynamics of, of intensification, expansion, diversification, or value adding, because they are somehow trapped into an ecosystem that is changing, a kind of resource base that is decreasing, and the, uh, the difficulties of integrating into other uh, kind of dynamics such as markets. Uh, this is why, in my opinion, uh, very often when we look at pastoral areas, we, we, I mean, very often pastoral areas are brought into the news by the kind of alternative livelihoods uh, the, uh, the herders get into, from piracy in Somalia to the, the kidnapping somewhere else, to the, the insurgency and the joining the militia of some, some groups, uh, some, some radical groups in some other regions, to the issue of piracy and the issue of trafficking. These are some kind of alternative livelihoods, to put this into a livelihoods perspective, the pastoralists are going through in order to face modernity because they don't seem to have access to many other instruments. I would uh, stop at this stage and uh, leave room for discussion by thanking you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. If there are questions from your side, please uh, just speak up. This is Nancy Morgan from the World Bank. I'm actually FAO's liaison to the World Bank. And Michelle, that was a fantastic presentation. And it was, it was, it was really, it, it's challenging because right now I'm looking at a concept note for the bank for $250 million investment in regional pastoral livelihoods resilience project, which is based in East it's based in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Uganda. So I'm actually just printed it off this concept note, and we have a consultant going out. I guess the question that I have, because I'm not a pastoralist expert, I'm a livestock economist, but the 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 point that you mentioned of having, you know, just not very successful projects. I mean, what do we know about what works and what doesn't work? And I'm particularly interested in the context of this project because I'm really struggling to you know, look at it in a context of new and innovative ideas for enabling pastoralists. Well, thanks very much, Nancy. Uh, what works and what doesn't work? Let me first say that uh, pastoral areas in the last, let's say, two decades have been 
have been somehow set aside by uh, development investments because they are part of the agricultural picture and, and agriculture was set down in, into the policy agenda of international donors. But more specifically because uh, investing in pastoral areas, and there is a very interesting document that was uh, done by the World Bank in the early 2000s, I think that is called definitely investing in pastoralism. Investing in pastoralism is very difficult because, uh, as I said, the transaction costs of any kind of investment are very high, and therefore we know about very uh, few things that have made really a big change into pastoral areas for the better. Uh, one aspect that has been always uh, associated to good intervention is the one on livestock health. I just would like to, to recall here the PACE program that has been uh, very instrumental in, uh, in eradicating rinder pests and therefore uh, improving the, the livelihood of many pastoralists all over Africa and not only in Africa. There seems to be a, another program that, that, that goes along the same lines on La Peste de Petit Ruminant, PPR, that is another disease this time for small stock rather than for cattle, that I know FAO is behind that and there's also the, the European Commission that is interested in, uh, in finding opportunities to support it. Uh, so livestock health is definitely one aspect that has provided some, some good outcomes. Another one has been the investment in water, in water sources from the boreholes to more recently water harvesting. I think the well, though when it comes to water very, very often, there have been problems associated to the, the social and the environmental aspects of uh, the, the water access and the water utilization. So this is just to say where we have some positive examples. We have very many negative examples. Uh, there are books and lists on this. I won't go to, into that, but I'm just interested in mentioning that uh, some organizations, and I know about the European Commission, is looking into its own experience, try to find uh, uh, try to find out what has been working effectively and what did not. So you might uh, want to contact some people in other organizations that are going through the same process of looking into best practices and lessons learned. I see uh, a good uh, deal of, of improvement when it comes to the more recent technologies, the kind of remote technologies from the mobile phones to the use of GIS-based system. I think uh, they can definitely they can, uh, they can provide opportunities to invest in pastoral areas uh, at a lower cost because they could uh, uh, enhance the, the policing and, and the, the checking of certain investments as well as they could improve the communication side of uh, the pastoral communities, which has always been a very difficult aspect. Before you had to set up a, a whole telephone line in order or the, a whole kind of radio system in order to get in touch with pastoral communities in the bush, Nowadays, you can easily find ways through mobile phones or, or, GPI, or GPS uh, systems that could, uh, could enhance this kind of communication at a much lower cost. So I would be very positive on ICT, they are called as such, Information Communication Technologies. I know that there is also a kind of, uh, there are important changes in the policy frame. Uh, in the African Union, uh, 2010, they've been drafting a policy guideline for pastoral areas. Uh, uh, IGAD, uh, ECOWAS, and other regional bodies uh, have been working on that uh, as well. And I think there's a kind of recognition that uh, uh, a, a kind of uh, a, a, a totally renewed policy frame is needed in order to enable investments in pastoral areas. Uh, so from the technical to the policy level, I would say there's room for hope. But definitely, given the fact that in the last 20 years there's been very little going on, I would say that uh, the best is yet to come, and this is what we all hope. Thank you, Michel. Are there follow-up questions on this, or maybe a questions going in a, a totally other direction? Hi, Nancy. That's Carola from GSS. I fully understand you are you are yeah you are struggling on a on a concept note on on such a huge program because actually I have a similar um, or. A, particular the end of last year when the Horn of Africa was such a political topic, I had a lot of um, problems in also co giving comments and, and adjustments to such papers. Um, we, we're struggling actually with the same um, question and we, for instance we're just carrying out a study, I, I said this already to Michele, um, is a kind of status quo, what have we done, what have we achieved? Um, during the last two decades, and 
being honest, it's difficult to bring things together and to to bring it in line with what international the international status quo and the international way actually is. Um, what I observe is that, in particular in, in, the, in the Horn of Africa, and that means Somalia, uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, that, that, there, that there's a lot of money available, but, but what I observe is that, um, in particular in the case of Ethiopia, I can say so, is that, that the absorption capacity in the region are not available, not at all, and that donors do not communicate sufficient with each other in terms of approaches, in terms of resources, in terms of uh, project layout, all this kind of stuff. So, so this is where, where I see, Michele, that I think there is, there is quite an investment in, in um, pastoralism, but this kind of project take a lot of time. I am speaking for our ministry, I have to say, they are not always that patient to invest in projects lasting five to ten years. This has been has been done in the past, but it's left in the future in the in the in the uh, present. And another comment I would like to add on on the issue of alternatives on uh, your point of limited opportunities to decrease vulnerability is. And um, I remember Henning Steinfeld when he talked generally about livestock development is that we lack on exit strategies. I mean, um, intensification will most likely go in line that we that some of them well, that we will have dropouts. And um, I think um, we should keep in our mind also how what kind of alternatives opportunities. Could be for this kind of people who grow up in pastoralism environment. Let me just jump on this because I, I agree totally. Uh, to come back to the second part of uh, your questioning, uh, the dropout, the migration out of pastoral areas is definitely a, a process that is taking place at a very high speed in, in certain regions. Some people are very afraid of that. It's always been the case that. Uh, we have people getting out of the, the rural setting, not only in pastoral areas, but even from farming communities. So I wouldn't think this is a, a process more worrying than other processes taking, taking effect in rural areas. What is worrying is that very often these people, the new generations, even the, the, the newest generation, they, they had very little access to any kind of education or formal education or, or any kind of training and formation. So this gives them uh, much more difficulties in to find alternative livelihoods in, uh, in, in any other kind of setting, either if they migrate in the capital city or if they, they migrate in other countries. Uh, not by chance, if you go uh, around in some, some capital cities, in, uh, especially in uh, the Sahelian uh, belt, you find that the, most of the, uh, the people begging on the streets, they tend to come from pastoral groups. I'm mentioning the Karamoja for Uganda. I could mention some pearl communities in uh, Senegal and in Cameroon, and uh, we could go on with this for uh, for many other groups. But this is a uh, fact in, in in time that very often pastor is not having access to a, a, a proper schooling system or a kind of uh, nomadic education that uh, uh, that provides them the right interface with other kind of a, of a different or alternative livelihoods find more problems when out-migrating from pastoral areas. And the out-migration is definitely something that will, that is taking place and will increasingly take place because of the figures that we've seen. And definitely these people, once more, they don't, very often they don't have uh, the, the, the capacities in terms of, uh, of human resources. They don't have the skills to engage into any kind of alternative livelihood. So there's been recently some studies done on how to set back a nomadic, a nomadic education system in countries such as Kenya. This is something that uh, Ms. Morgan might be interested in. There's a whole study about uh, nomadic education systems in Kenya, finding the proper ways utilizing ICT technologies, I mean, IT technologies in order to give uh, the pastoral children the opportunity to go to school without necessarily leaving their community at an early stage of the life. So the issue of human resources, the, the human capital of pastoral areas is not yet adequate to the challenges of jumping into diverse or alternative livelihoods. Thank you, Michelle. Um, are there 
other questions coming in. Nancy again. And I really appreciate it. I know in Chad they were doing something with mobile um, schools or something like that. But the question then, it comes down to when I'm looking at a project proposal to enhance livelihood resilience to weather shocks, blah, 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 for pastoralism, and it's focusing on strengthening the pastoralist management, you know, natural rangeland management, and then this whole thing on it facilitating access to, to regional trade and markets. I mean, it's very traditional. So maybe the, I mean, maybe from a development standpoint, maybe the best investment would be just to focus on educating, educating, and provide educating pastoral communities, and then providing animal health, animal health services. I don't know, you know, I'm just looking at this the concept notes that was designed, and I'd really like Carla's input too because it's so traditional that it seems like it's just set up for failure. If I might jump into this again, I agree there is very little uh, innovative thinking very often, but uh, I would definitely agree that the issue of a proper education system in nomadic areas is uh, something that nowadays is feasible because the costs are much lower than they used to be because of the IC technologies, and the need is there. I remember about 10 years ago, pastoral people in, uh, from Mauritania to Somalia again, it would have been very difficult for a, a, a pastoral household to send a child to school because there was no interest in that. Nowadays, wherever I go, I was in Djibouti recently with the, the Afar communities, and everywhere you see that uh, at least as a, as a strategy to diversify the, the, the household economy, many pastoral families are very willing to send uh, at least one or two children to school, and very often the facility is, is not there because Sometimes somebody builds up a school that lasts for one or two years and then the teacher disappears and everything falls back into, into, into picture zero. So uh, nowadays I would say that uh, politically and technologically there is uh, an enabling framework to invest in nomadic education definitely. And this is something that is needed, not because pastoralism will never be there again, but because in order for pastoralism, as I said, to, to survive and to improve, uh, it needs to uh, to better cast to better to be better embedded into the wider picture, and I think that having a part of the family that is able to go to school to communicate and to live a different life and to engage the pastoralists with the urban economy, I think this is something that is uh, very much needed. I would mention the example of Somalia. I mean, northern Somalia, because when when we mention Somalia, very many people associate it to conflict, uh, and, and that's and that's all. But if we look at the northern part of Somalia, just to to remain in the Horn of Africa, Somaliland and Puntland, they've been living quite peacefully in the last, 30, in, in the last 20 years, uh, d despite what was going on in Mogadishu and surroundings, and they've developed their own economies based on pastoralism in quite a successful way. And I could tell you that most of the families that have been uh, improving their livelihood, they've been using part of their, uh, their wealth to send the children to school. So even without the central government, even without a kind of recognized formal setting, those communities have been able to improve their, their, their economy, to invest in their livelihood, and therefore to in, invest into, into, in, in, into education in order to provide a different future, at least partially, to the next generation. So I think uh, nomadic education is definitely something I would suggest to look into. And uh, taking the example of uh, Northern Somalia on how to better engage with international marketing is also something that, to me, could teach a lot of of lessons, but just mentioning lessons learned, if I can get back the, the, the driver of my presentation, I have one slide about some principles that I've been drafting out for the European Commission recently that uh, might be of use for uh, people such as Nancy that is uh, in these days looking into a new proposal. I could send you them and I could send you even some more materials and contacts, just you, you send me an email and we can keep in touch accordingly. But at least here you can find some key, some, some key principles that I think we should uh, keep in mind whenever thinking about investing in pastoral areas. Thanks, okay. Michelle. I'm looking at the principles now and they're very interesting, yeah. There is uh, another question coming in from uh, my colleague in the platform secretariat, Pascal Corbet. 
Hi, Michele and everyone. Um, um, Uli has introduced me already. I just wanted to make a, a quick comment basically on the basis of where I'd worked before. I used to be uh, in communications as an advisor at AUI Bar before and at the time they, there was a pastoralism initiative started and we had some, um, some interaction there in, in the Somaliland and there was one thing that um, might be actually quite logical, but I think it's sometimes maybe not really reflected upon. It was the experience when we went out on field trips there, um, that the that the, uh, the the herds, the camel herds, and all that, they were not really kept by families. And there was there was the request by the pastoral families on the nomadic education and so forth that their that their children are running away. But on the other hand, what I had seen there, maybe that's it's not st statistically uh, relevant, but my, my, my finding, personal finding, was that there were one or two people that were paid for to live with the animals. Well, they were paid in, in tea and the milk and, and a little bit more to, to, to do the herding. And the owners of these large herds were actually living in Iziolo, so in these sort of smaller towns close by. And maybe you can say something on, on that on your perspective, because maybe that is a tendency of, I don't know if that's an industrialization or whatever you want to call that, but it's some some different way of, of um, some aspect that's not really reflected that maybe what we, what we think is the livestock, um, maybe somewhat even romantic idea of how this actually works is not really um, the way it's going to be in the in the in the near future, Mikael. Thanks for this opportunity. In fact, when we talk about mobility, there are different there are definitely different forms and different degrees of mobility. We go from nomadism, that is the one that used to be in the in the poetry books and the, the ones that we that has been so much kind of romanticized. That is people moving along, just following the clouds and the rains without any any special uh, kind of uh, uh, attachment land. And then the, the, there is the transhumans, that is the people moving in and off from one area to another and more or less following a kind of cycle throughout the year. And then there are other forms of uh, more or less mobility up to the point of agro-pastoralism and the semi sedentarization And I think there's a process definitely that you mentioned, whereas we can see that even in the Sahara where nomadism was uh, definitely the, the strategy, uh, increasingly, we see that part of the family tends to remain uh, settled somehow, at least for part of the year, in a certain spot, and uh, especially during the harsh or dry seasons, just one part of the family, very often the youngsters and the, the biggest part of the herd or the flock, they move along in order to look for, for the good grazing areas. So there is definitely a tendency to have a double uh, mobility setting, and this also offers opportunity to uh, for uh, for kind of approaches that look into nomadic education or look into or, or look into market integration. Very often, people try. I mean, the communities they tend to settle down or sedentarize very close to water points. So this also uh, kind of raises a, a warning when we think about developing water points, because very often wherever you put a borehole or, or wherever you put a, a big reservoir, it's very likely that people will settle for a while. And therefore, uh, the implications for the environment and for the, the conflict of the, I mean, the access to the resources and the possible conflict should be looked into. But definitely, it is true that pastoralism in, uh, in terms of purely nomadism is something that is decreasing. And what we increasingly see is uh, uh, temporary or partial forms of uh, semi sedentarization or kind of agro-pastoralism, because very often this is also associated to the the farming of certain crops, uh, such as millet or sorghum. Uh, so this is a situation that pastoralism is changing, is changing quite fast. And if you fly nowadays from uh, Argeisa in Somaliland to uh, Diredawa or to Addis Ababa, what you see below is the, the Hout, is a very kind of semi-desertic area that used to be completely uh, utilized for grassland, for, for grassland grazing. And nowadays, it is all fenced and all plotted into small fences, meaning that the kind of privatization and the kind of intensification of resource use in the area has been, uh, has been going very fast in the last two decades. This was because, 
of the lucrative international marketing or livestock trading to the Arab countries. So, uh, so pastoralism is changing from one region to another. The, the dynamics are different, but definitely there are some patterns that you can recognize I mean, throughout the, the areas of, uh, of the world. Okay, and um, I think uh, we have uh, a bit of time left for for last question. Is uh, there anyone? I would like to add one point. Sorry, just to, uh, before jumping in, into the next question, possible. When it comes to the issue of Nancy and Carola about uh, the dropouts and the, the marginalization and the different kind of uh, education or knowledge that should be brought into the picture. I think what is missing nowadays is uh, a place where pastoralism is uh, thought about in positive terms. If you think about just the, the fact that if, uh, if somebody wants to become a, a, vet, a veterinary in, uh, veterinarian sorry, in uh, Somalia or Uganda or Ethiopia or Kenya or Senegal or Mali or whatever else, they have to go to a university that is very often based in a non dryland area that is very often based in the high plateau in, in close to the river in very green and poshy spots meaning that what they learn very often is also associated to the kind of investments related to the so-called the higher potential areas there is no place nowadays where you can uh, study livestock production system in pastoral areas there's no place in the world where you can definitely study and be trained on uh, uh, livestock health in uh, dryland so there is no place where uh, the education and the, the the knowledge that is related to to pastoralism is uh, processed is transmitted and is elaborated so i think this is a major gap and what i would suggest for the future is to think about i mean creating some kind of hubs in east africa and west africa and central asia at least where where pastoralism could be thought of in a positive way and where uh, training courses uh, innovative technologies and whatever else could be defined and, uh, and investments could be defined accordingly. Because this is something to me that is missing. If we don't start thinking and talking, I mean, in a positive way about pastoralism, it's very difficult that the, the things on the ground will change. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Now, um, anyone uh, with a brief uh, last question? I don't have a question. I just would like to point out, uh, coming back to what Pascal said um, during his time in um, in Ivor, that during the same time with regard to the issue of role of women, of uh, female pastoralists, um, there was a world conference in India on that topic. And um, when you look in the documents from this, from this event, um, it's the, the question of the marketing is very, very crucial and connected with this also the access to and the control over the resources. And so I, I would add it on even on the challenges and opportunities, the market in relation what you said with ICT and also in relation with um, upcoming livestock insurance opportunities, no? which is the kind of security um, instrument and also related to this issue the role of the women is the, is, is the status quo in the women in the in the pastoralist um, society and the rights of women rights in there no? so this is something I personally like also to keep in my mind um, that we also have a more gender um, divided or differentiated look at the whole topic yeah, this goes along with the things that Pascal was mentioning about the, how pastoralism is changing and how the commu some communities are changing their lifestyle and definitely it goes along with the role of women that is changing fast and the, 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 the role within the economy and society is, is, uh, is changing for the better and for the worse. My specific PhD thesis a few years ago was finished in 2010 was about the development of camel milk marketing in, uh, in Puntland, in northeastern Somalia. And definitely this is an unbelievable system, very, very sophisticated, that was uh, uh, that somehow uh, was impossible about 20 years ago because there was a taboo and is all managed by women. So uh, this tells you how, uh, even uh, in a situation when th there's a degree of conflict or insecurity, there is no central state supporting any kind of development, 
in a very harsh environment, uh, touched by a number of droughts, still uh, the local society can can kind of respond positively to, to these challenges, and the role that women played in this challenge was was unbelievable. So if anybody is interested, I can send you a copy of this uh, electronic copy of this document that in fact documents how women have been taking to change the, the economic agenda of, of a country in the last 20 years. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Uh, so, if uh, any one of the participants is uh, interested in uh, the document Michelle just mentioned, uh, please just get in contact with us in the Secretariat and uh, we, we are happy to establish contact between you. Um, well, then uh, time is nearly over and uh, I would like uh, to thank Michelle for a very nice and interesting presentation and uh, also all participants uh, for a very lively uh, discussion. Um, we will now, with, uh, as you know, we've recorded uh, today's virtual briefing and uh, we will now do some slight edits and then it will be available on our website very soon so also a wider audience uh, can access uh, Michelle's presentation and uh, your discussion. Um, Michelle, uh, any last words uh, from your side? Yeah, well, thanks again, as I said, thanks very much for this opportunity. I would like to raise a, a last warning because we've been thinking about how to improve things, but to me a major concern is how to uh, how to intervene so that the things uh, would not get worse than they are. And I think the issue of land, as I said, so trying to look very carefully onto the land deals, land contracts, land acquisition schemes that are taking place in pastoral areas, these hold the potentials, as we discussed before, uh, with Uri himself, uh, these hold the potentials to, to, to create even harsher and more conflictual conditions in pastoral areas. So I think uh, let's be very careful about what's taking place in, in rangeland areas when it comes to so-called land grabs, because the potential of uh, worsening the situation is very high. This is just the last warning to be aware that land is a major critical aspect when it comes to pastoral livelihoods nowadays. Mm -hmm.